All right, today we back with another episode of Check the Credit, y'all. For the people unfamiliar or just seeing this for the first time, y'all need to understand what Check the Credits is about, right? This is a podcast where we show respect, pay homage, and give props to producers, songwriters, engineers, um, just people behind the scenes that a lot of times in today's climate, the way the music industry is, they aren't, you know, they aren't shown the proper respect in some cases or the the information is not there for you to know who did what so on this podcast we kind of shed light on that and give them the opportunity to speak and put their uh accomplishment accomplishments out there for the world to see um and on this episode we have a producer songwriter engineer musician he, he got he do a whole bunch of stuff man you feel me a whole bunch of stuff He's worked with the likes of Jay Holiday, uh, Case, J Lo, Rick Ross, Bone Thugs and Harmony, Snoop Dogg, Jazzy Faye, uh, Demetria McKinney. Uh, uh, I mean, countless of others, right? The right, TT and them, Kevin Kev. Listen, we everybody, anybody you could think of, he didn't work with him. You feel me? So right now, without further ado, we got Grammy nominated, um, Golden Platinum producer. My brother Travis Cherry in the building. What's going on, my brother? What's going on, my brother? What is going on? Hey man, you hey, we doing what we do. So I still I see you still at it. You know what I mean? I had to represent anybody that knows my brother Travis Cherry knows that that studio is called the Purple Room. So I had to throw on some purple <laughs> attire to represent the purple room when I'm doing this interview. I, it, it would, anything else would be uncivilized. I'm just me? saying. So, I'm just you saying. Feel me? So, I mean, I, I always started off this way. I always ask my guests because I start off with who you worked with. But to make people a little more familiar, let some of the people know some of the records you've done for some of these people. Oh, man. Um, sheesh. You know, I'm, I'm, I got what Jay Holiday's first two albums. I did um, Come Here on that album. I did um, the remix to Bed with Trina Ja Rule on it. Um, Second album did make that sound. Did wrong level with Rick Ross. Um, I got a record out with Rick Ross. Um, worked with Bone Thugs and Harmony um, on their um, Thug Stories album, and then the album um, they did with Swiss. I had a record with Flesh and Bone um, before he got out of jail. So it was kind of it was a crazy experience um, with that one. Like I said, um, definitely one with Trina. Definitely, you know, Keith Sweat, like Case. Man, we got a hot single about to drop in the next um, probably month or so, probably less than a month with him, um, Raheem Devon. Oh, man. can't forget Raheem Devon. <laughs> Temperature rising. What's up with that? Yes, that was sir. one of my joints right there. Yes, sir. You know, got that, that little R. Kelly fingerprint on it. You know, and okay, I know people, okay. I know people don't like to talk about that, but I'm like, hey, man, <laughs> the man name is on the credit. So, like, I. I can't get around it, you know. You feel me? You can't feel get me? around it, you know. People want to deny their work. I ain't gonna deny my work. Shoot, whatever he did at home ain't got nothing to do with me. Hey, hey. <laughs> I tell people all the time, bro. You gotta separate the genius from the freak. Pardon me. If you, if I mean, <laughs> I, hey, hey, hey. One is one thing. One another day. I, I I can't knock his genius. I don't know about all the other stuff he got going. I mean, on. but we we we've allowed so much in the game, you know. I mean, we, Again, we, we, and yeah, we can't single him out because he ain't the only one. He definitely man, ain't the only one. Man, listen, we, a lot we of know people he ain't being quiet one. right now. A lot exactly. of people don't want to speak. Exactly, my brother. So, um, because you wear multiple hats, I've been around you. I've worked with you in the studio. I know your abilities. What do you prefer? Though? What's like your what? What would you say? Okay, this is what I really do. This is what I really love doing. Which one would it be? The producer, engineering, vocal producer. Like, what's your thing? Yeah. What do you really love doing? Honestly, production. I love. I love just the producing side of it, man. Honestly, like, gotcha. Creating something from the ground up, something that just didn't exist, and also that moment when you you marry the right song with the right artist, and it just clicks and it connects, and you know you got a hot record that, that's definitely coming out. I love that part. Okay, okay, and um, again, something that I I've seen firsthand, and I know um, I I I could only assume, right? Um, coming from the era we come from. I know you, I would assume that you prefer to be in the studio than, and being a part of the entire creative process versus sending. Yeah. Oh no, I hate email. that. I hate that. I hate that right now. Like I really honestly got to hate that. Like when you send in something to somebody and you got to wait on them to do it, like it's like, dog, like it's, it's just, it's cold. It doesn't have the same feeling. It doesn't, um, 
that doesn't have that magic, you know. So you send somebody yeah. to beat and then they running around with everybody like, oh, you know, we work <laughs> together. It's like I don't know you. Like, who are you? Who are you? Like, <laughs> like <laughs> but I don't know you. Like, yeah, yeah, we have a song together, but we didn't do anything together. Like. <laughs> Yeah, man, that, that's that's definitely the the climate we in right now, man. That's and that's one of the reasons, man, um, that I decided to actually do this because in my travels and my journey, I meet a lot of people. A lot of people, I mean, I've met young producers in the supermarket. You know, what I'm mm-hmm. saying it might be like, yo, I did such and such for so and so. I worked with Gucci Mane. I worked with, and mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, y'all was in the studio. I was like, nah, I never met him. Um, yep. <clears throat> yep. Um, I don't. And, and I just thought that it's you know, obviously they have enough talent in a in a um in the realm of making beats or producing a sound mm-hmm. and, and enough that it's getting recognized and people want to use it. But it's mm-hmm. like you know I feel like the experience nothing's better than that experience and learning and really getting a full hands on production experience because that's one side producing a beat is just mm-hmm. that producing a beat. Yeah, you, you just made a mean? beat. That's it. Yeah, and that, and that's cool. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know what I mean? But at the end of the day. You want to be a part of the process. You want to be mm-hmm. trying to grow and build the name and the foundation. You want to learn how to work with artists and understand all of the dimensions and levels and layers it is to making records and making music. So okay, yeah. so so then, what do you think about this new like wave where like you send a beat to somebody and you're not even in the studio and an engineer moves certain sections around and now they want to get mm-hmm. co-production credit? Um. I think they are arranging and co-producing. They are. I don't necessarily agree with it um, in terms of, I mean, technically they are a part of the, the process. So I understand why they want the credit. I just don't think that that's, in my opinion, the best way. I really believe that, you know, when you sit down and you create a sound or a song or beat, you have things in mind. And I think that it's unfair to remove me from the process. Let me, I may have a better idea or better concept. I may have, you know, for my, in our time, we would, we might even give somebody a beat. I won't say a skeleton, but it might have just the basic idea. They might lay vocals on it or chorus. And then you start adding more instrumentation mm-hmm. and changing and building. I just think that it's unfair to not give the original creator the option to do that. Now, don't yeah. get me wrong. You could put some other people in the room. You know, you look at some production credits, like I think I seen Sicko Mode. I forgot how many writers and producers is on it's like Sicko 30. Mode. It's like thirty. Yeah, people on there because some you know all those people touched it in some way, shape, or form, or fashion. Now, I respect you know people wanting to give people credit, but it's just like sometimes it just like come on, bro. It don't take all of that to do it. You too know many what I mean? Like yeah, like it's too but, many uh, yeah, cooks I'm in like, the kitchen. Yeah, I'm like if I send you a record, I put an eight bar verse on there, and you just extend four bars and make it a twelve. <laughs> you didn't co-produce that. You didn't create. <laughs> You didn't you didn't create yeah. no new sound. You didn't add to it. You just you did your job. Yeah. And I think um yeah, and that's the blurred line because there is no producer a lot of the times in the studio. It is the artist and the engineer. So it forces the engineer to, you know, sometimes become the producer. So that's where they I think it all of a lot of stuff is by default. I don't necessarily feel like they they're doing anything wrong. It's like again, if I came in and, and it was nothing but a beat there. Even if a producer just gave me a beat and we went in the studio and whoever, me and I don't, LL, whoever it is, made the record together and the producer's not there, I did produce the song with him. Even if I didn't do the beat, he produced the beat, but I produced the song. So a lot of times by default, these artists are getting beats emailed to them on the spot um, and no direction, nobody there. Like So they don't know. I've given people beats. And when I got the song back, they made that they didn't even rearrange it um like by cutting it and moving it. They just rapped too long and made the hook the verse and made rap where the verse was supposed to be, you know, all kinds of crazy stuff. So I just think that, you know, it does, in my opinion, kind of hinder the the best outcome. You know, there's been records where it's only been the artist and he took the beat and ripped it and made a hit. That happens too. So it's not impossible, but it's more likely and more common that if the creatives who made the music or was involved in that process is there, I think you just have a better outcome. So for me, it's just, it's, it's kind of weird, but I, I do, I understand because I'm a person that's a firm believer in if you contribute it, you should be credited. I don't believe that, oh, it's only did this or they only did this little minor thing because that minor thing can change it. I've been in sessions where somebody told somebody to say, change a word or, you know, put this line and, and change that last bar and do this. They didn't really do anything if you look at it in the grand scheme of it, but 
the outcome made it better. So that's a part of the, you know, a part of the process. So, so are you cutting him in on the pub? Um, it depends. You know what I'm saying? Like I said, I, I, it's not an argument where I would be like adamantly against it. You know what I'm saying? Because they contribute. It just depends. You know what I mean? It depends on how much of it was done and how valuable it was. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Sure. It, just, it just depends. But I'm not, you know, against it. I just think a lot of times people are already, you know, so wanting as much as they could possibly get because everybody's trying to get to a certain point or this mm-hmm. record could be a hit. So everybody's grabbing. But to me, if everybody doesn't play a part, do we have the out- end result? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? If you don't have Dr. Dre, Scott Storch, Michael Lenzo, the mm-hmm. engineer, the songwriter, do we have the same record when it's finished? Yeah. You know, we got to look at it from that standpoint. It's like, yeah, I might have only did this, but remove that only. And we'll never know because it's already done. Yeah. So we, you know, it's, it's kind of hard, you know. Okay. For sure. But um, something I wanted to, to ask you also, because I know you do R&B, rap, hip hop, like, what's your preference? What do you prefer doing? Um, I think in, in, if you'd ask me this in times <laughs> past, <laughs> I don't know. I think, uh, I, I think if you'd ask me maybe 10 years ago, I might've said, you know, I might've kind of, you know, skewed towards the hip hop <laughs> side of it. Cause I didn't really embrace my R and B side as much because I, I didn't really, I guess, realize how important my contributions were to the world of R and B. Gotcha. Um, now, yeah, I love R and B because I think that it needs a um, it needs a shot in the arm, mm. and I think it, that's tough, you know, because I think you know where where the business is now. I can't really. I mean, I, I want to do more hip hop stuff, and I do do hip hop stuff with certain artists or with certain younger artists, but because things have merged, where you almost don't even know what's a hip hop song, <laughs> what's an R&B song, yeah. You know, I think that producing is important. Being able to vocal produce somebody is important. Being able to find that artist is important. And I think it's time to separate the two. You know, like everybody who picks up autotune and tries to make a song is not necessarily a hip hop artist or R&B artist. And it needs to be that dividing line again. Got you. Got you. So for me, yeah, R&B, because I I just, I just, you know, I I, I still love the spirit of it. and And I still realize how important I still am to it. Got you. So we we kind of sped up and jumped up ahead a little bit. So I want to bring it back, and I need to know, first of all, where are you from originally? Uh, originally Raleigh, North Carolina, all day. Oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> and so I'm not, I, I'm sure, because I, I mean, going back to the time period when you started, I'm not sure what kind of a, was there a music scene there? How did you break into music mm-hmm. as far as, producing mm-hmm. where your artist first like what how did you get into it um i started out as an artist um what's kind of crazy is yeah like as far as an actual music scene there we we had a couple of artists that broke or that, that got on early you know because mm-hmm. I, I started when i when i graduated high school so around that time um, we had this one group um that i think they were they were signed and had um an album out was at yag food front Oh yeah, I remember them. Rap. Yeah. I remember them. Yeah. Yeah. And then you had um Southern Cat, um, a friend of mine, um, A. G. Thomas. He was signed to Capitol Records. Um, so there was kind those kind of like the first two that we really knew were signed. Um, I think coming from that area, you know, you knew you 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 saw a lot of talented people. Um, you know, everybody was kinda of hitting the talent show, stuff like that. Um I started out in an R and B group, like singing in an R and B group. And, you know, you always knew groups because it's kind of like how people yeah. talk about like Detroit and Motown. Like there's always groups around. Everybody <laughs> always formed a little group or something. People sitting around singing. But nobody really I don't think anybody really re- knew that it could be a career because it, the bar was set so high. And it was like, yeah, the only way you was getting on was you had to go to New York because, you know, for us, we heard the stories of Jodeci at that time. because Jodeci came out of yeah. Charlotte. Yeah. So you knew they went to New York or, you know what I'm saying? You, you knew of certain other artists that may have been from North Carolina, like gospel artists and stuff like that, that all did that. Um, me and my group, you know, we ended up, I mean, we had some offers. We, we, um, our, our, the main thing that got us really here was coming to Atlanta for this, um, label that we had met in North Carolina. Okay. And, 
you know, I guess that's one thing that we still hold um, is that we came here versus what everybody else going to New York to get on. We came to Atlanta and got on. Um, I don't think anybody else had done that at the time. You know, nobody else got, you know, being able to do that. So, yeah, coming from that area, it, it was so it's so heavy on the church. So you saw the, the singers coming out of, that, out of the church, you know, gotcha. that you saw the talent show. So, yeah. And so now, how do we get from being in a singing group to becoming a producer? <laughs> how, how how does that go? Um, throughout the, the whole point, the whole the whole time of being an artist, me and my homeboy Rich, we always like wrote all the records and um, worked on all the music. So I didn't really realize that we were producing. We just thought, you know, me and him would get together and just work on these, <laughs> these little ideas musically. And I think um, my sophomore year in college, um, like. My homeboy Devron, I used to go to his dorm room and he had all these beats because he was from New York. And I was like, damn, he had he was the coolest dude. And you know, I used to sit there in his in his dorm room and write to some of his beats. And I used to be like, man, I want to do stuff like this. And so um, around like ninety eight, um, me and my group, <clears throat> we had left our second record deal, and um, I basically just sat in the house for like a year. I bought some equipment and like like an MPC and some keyboard and stuff like that. And I just sat in the house for like a year trying to teach myself how to make my little beats and stuff on my own because two of us in my group stayed here. Two went back to North Carolina. Gotcha. And um, 99, I ended up um, just a fluke. I was in Kroger's in Sandy Springs. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I mean, in Dunwoody <clears throat> off Northridge and, Standing in line, and this dude was in front of me. Um, his name was Mose. He was in front of me, and I heard him singing. And this was 11, 12 o'clock at night. And I'm like, dang, you sing? He's like, yeah. I was like, well, you know, I, I kind of produce. And he was like, well, I'm signed to this label. We down the street. And I'm like, word. He's like, you need to come to the studio sometime. I'm like, okay. So, shoot, fast forward. A couple of days later, I went to his, um, went to their studio, Dark City Records out of D.C. And, um, you know, I just, I just, I was hustling. Shoot. My mom got was, you. My mom always taught me. She's like, no matter what job you go to, they got to teach you their way. So you always say that you can do whatever it is they need you to do. So it was like, can you engineer? I'm like, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they was like, well, okay, so you sing, you produce, and you engineer. And they ended up signing me. And from oh, wow. There, and yeah, from there, man, it was like, it was just crazy. Like I, I just got on. You know, two years straight, I was with them back and forth to D.C. and doing everything, man. It was a it was a crazy, crazy experience with Dark City. Um, they had a movie that they had filmed because um, they had to deal with Tommy Boy. And um, okay. they ended up getting Morgan Freeman in it because um, Poe, um, one of the owners, he was dating Morgan Freeman's daughter, um, Morgana, at the time. And that's true. Man, it was crazy. I learned a whole lot from them. Okay, okay. So now, how do we go from so in that in that era were you working with like sign artists, known artists, or what is just like? Okay, mm -hmm. yeah, like I got a I got a chance to do a record with Scarface during that time, and okay, Rat would be around the studio recording. Um, because they had a house that they bought and they converted it into a studio. Into a studio, gotcha. gotcha. Yeah, they had this, this nice house out in Dunwoody. Um, and so it was a lot of celebrities coming through there, and I was just kind of thrown into the fire. Right, you know, either recording or um, the the engineer Alvin Spites. I mean, you know, mm. rest in rest peace, in peace. Alvin. yes, That's Alvin. I learned so much yep. from Alvin because Alvin used to come through whenever he wasn't at dark, and he would be, you know, mixing or you know, engineering certain little things there in the studio. Okay, okay. To work alongside of him, and yeah, got to learn studio etiquette and how to take care of a studio, everything. Cause I was I was pretty much the engineer producer. I was the runner. Oh you know, yeah, you know what That's I'm saying. Like had to keep keep gas in the company vehicles and where we paying. I time. tell her he was paying dudes, man. Man, That's all that was. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> you got that paid dudes, man. Bro. I keep telling people they want to the, the kids that they, they want to skip the line, bro. They don't know about no paying dudes, bro. They don't they, know. They, no, 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 no. They, they don't, don't want to pay no dudes. They want to go from the bedroom to the mm. billboard charts. And we out of here, and we we on top. We yeah, we, we at the Wolf for story. Want, yeah, want to go to the store and buy the bottle though. Never, never the time, bro. <laughs> so I always say that, man. That that process, um, you learn so much, and without going through that, you like, in my opinion, it's like it helps to prepare you for what you're going to deal with later on down the line. Mm -hmm. So to skip it is kind of like 
it's a it's a uh, a setback and an inconvenience for you. You don't really know it, but it is. It's like you know, it doesn't help prepare you. It's just like having a childhood where you're being guarded and you know not being able to do things and trying to be covered and and hidden from so much stuff that by the time you're in the real world, you don't know how to deal with nothing. Mm -mm. So nine times out of ten, because you ain't equipped. You're gonna fail horribly and miserably. You're gonna go through stuff you mm -hmm. didn't have to go through. So I and always you, tell people, I love, I love what I went through. I love the whole process of it. Yeah, I you know wouldn't change I mean? it. I wouldn't change nah. it. The amount nah. of knowledge that I got, the amount of connections I made, exactly everything. Like you know, I, I like I, I told my lady before. It's, I look at it now. There's been so many times during that time when I felt like I was ready, and I'm like, man, I'm ready. I'm ready to blow. I'm ready to blow. And now I look back at the time, and I'm like, I wasn't ready at all. At you know? all, <laughs> at all, bro. I say that all the time. Like it was situations I was in, and in that moment, you really feel like, "Yo, I damn, I messed up, or this didn't work." Mm -hmm. But you know, as time goes on, you re realize, nah, I would have been. You know, it's a, it's a point in time that if they have gave me the money I thought I wanted, mm -hmm. it'd have been all bad. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I'm like, it been if all I didn't have a hit bad, single bro. during that time, I didn't have no Ooh. beats to follow it up with. No, <laughs> no, no, no. That that's number one. You know what I mean? If you if you not really like again, you got to be prepared for the opportunity. So it's mm -hmm. all a building stage, bro. Mm -hmm. And I tell mm -hmm. people all the time when you see somebody, even when people go viral or have a moment, mm -hmm. you looking at that moment, but you ain't looking at. If you go back, most people, if you look at everybody who's went viral, had some type of explosion. Mm -hmm. Once they become popular, you go look back. They've been doing this. I look at some people's YouTubes. I looked at a YouTube channel the other day, and I was like, damn, this dude got 300 and something thousand subscribers. Mm -hmm. He popping now. But when I look, I was like, he started his YouTube page in 2013. Bro. You know so, what I'm saying? Oh, so, <laughs> so I'm listen. sure he didn't start out with that. You know what I mean? He listen. put in a lot of work. That's why, like, like the one person I always look at, and I'm like, if you weren't watching from the beginning, you wouldn't understand it now, or you wouldn't respect it now. I'm like, Cardi. Yeah, like party was doing little funny Vine videos yep. and stuff like that. Like even before you really knew that she was an artist, like she was a yeah. funny personality. Like she was hilarious. Yeah, like yeah. like now you see her and you'd be like, oh, she's Cardi B. But I'm like, man, from the beginning she was hilarious. You saw she was gonna be a star. Yeah, that's why they knew what to do with her and how to how to work it. The personality and the charisma and the the likabilities there. If you can, and she had. Talent. She has talent. Like people try yeah. to make it seem like she's, no, she's not talented. talented. She has talent. So when you add that, it just takes the right one thing we do know about with making music. If you mm -hmm. give that somebody with that level of likability, you know, skill set and persona, the right mm -hmm. music, they out of here. I don't care who exactly. it is. Exactly. They out of here. You just gotta give them the right music. Once you give them the right music, because it's a combination of all those things. A lot of people focus on just making great music or trying to make great music and eliminate the other part and you don't have the success. You can have a great song. There's songs that exist through time that we love the song, but we could care less about the artist or what the artist represents or stands for. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, that's you, something. Look, you're going to always start dancing when Laffy Taffy come on. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. You know I mean? <laughs> but it is what it is. It's just one of those records and moments in time, you know what I mean, when it comes to stuff like that. Do you? Um, so do you feel like now, like, um there's less moments um yeah like musically like do you feel like now like you know how like we can hear a song and remember where we were when it dropped you know what i'm saying like i remember the summer when like bbd came out you know what i'm saying i remember what i was doing when doomy came out i'm not gonna expose that i'm just <laughs> I may, yeah, you, pro I you probably been, shouldn't. I'm just going to keep I, it I, a, a buck with you. I was, I was, <laughs> so I was, I was in a relationship, my, though. I was in a relationship. Okay. Here's my take on that, right? Because I have – my kids now pretty much almost – I have one complete adult. My daughter's 22, will be 23 this year. My other daughter's 20, be 21 in February. Mm -hmm. Um. It's music I don't relate to that they love. That mm -hmm. they love how we love the first time I heard Eric B for president or mm -hmm. you know what I mean, No I Got Soul or Public Enemy. This it does the same thing for them. Mm -hmm. it, you know what I'm saying? It marks it stamps a moment in time for them. So mm -hmm. it's hard for me to kind of it's like when we was coming up and our music that we loved, our parents, or I got like older siblings that's like nine, 10, 11 years older than me. So a lot of the music, some of it didn't resonate, especially when rap came. They wasn't on that. So mm -hmm. for them, it doesn't have the same effect. Like if I, yo, I remember when Eric B, they looking at me like, yeah, okay, that was cool. Cause it doesn't mean the same thing for them. So I wouldn't necessarily say that there's not any more moments. 
I just think it's relative to the person or to that that genre, um, generation of people mm-hmm. that like it. Because to me, I would I wouldn't be thinking that you would be playing Soldier Boy. Tell him right now the the Soldier Boy up in it, and people would be responding and reacting the way that they do. But mm-hmm. for the people that was in high school and kids that loved it at that moment. It still hits them the same way, like a song, like you saying, like BBD or whatever hit us at that time period. Yeah, it's, I, I, mean, it, I just it, think it's currently though. I don't think that they have moments. Like I think because they're um, with this, there are some. I just it's don't disposable. Like I think that because it's so disposable, I don't think that a song sticks with them as long on the journey of life. Like. Like the last real song, I think that I would say probably will stick with people um, would be like something like LMA. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I can, long I can term. see that. You know what I'm saying? I can see that. But, but I think music in general is so disposable because I don't think the you got to remember, bro. We we're from the era where there's artists who still do it, and the only person I think of this day and time that you could tell that I feel like. They put a lot of work into their music, and they they're trying to make music the last. They make trendy music as well, but they mm-hmm. make music that last is Drake. I, yeah, I, I think I, I, it's I, all, I agree. Yeah, yeah, it's all. But again, now we looking at Drake. Drake has been in almost what going on fifteen years almost. It's like yeah. 12, so he's no longer like a new guy. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. He's about to be an old nigga in a minute to yeah. people. Yeah. So, but he's from the cloth of that era, so it's still instilled in him. So he still approaches it. That's yeah. why I used to tell people why Jay had the run he had because. Although he appeared to be like the same age as artists that was out, he's really not. Like Jay Z mm-hmm. is the same age as LL Cool J, same yep. age as Rakim, Big Daddy yeah. Kane. He just had a later start. So when people look at him, they don't realize he has the ability to morph both worlds. He's from the era before, and mm-hmm. he actually popped off in a, in a in a current era with more you know current things going on. So he had the best of both worlds and figured out how to morph them. So he took an and, 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 you know, kind of extended his career and mm-hmm. kept things moving. I think Drake is probably the next generation of something like that happening where he took a, a book from Jay-Z's, I mean, a chapter from Jay-Z's book and took the same kind of path and did it. But I, I don't know if we breed in those kind of artists anymore because everybody's looking to be, the reward is different now. You yeah. know, they plan for higher stakes. Like I tell people back in the day when 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 I was a kid, I'm reading a magazine and it said Eric B. and Rock Kim signed a million dollar contract. That mm-hmm. was amazing. Yeah. But it, it was a million dollar contract for four albums. It wasn't a million dollar advance. It was two hundred and fifty thousand mm-hmm. um a album. Yeah. It was there was a budget. It wasn't an advance. They might have got a fifty, thirty thousand mm-hmm. advance. But at that time, I feel like I don't want to say they starved artists longer, but I felt like you got to the. It took you a longer time to get to the bag, so you were more focused on trying to make great music. Nowadays, an artist know that I can make a one hit a quitter and we out of here. Yeah, you yeah. know what I'm saying. So they're not focused on trying to make a great body of work, mm-hmm. long t- lasting music. They're not incentivized to do that because yeah, they're incentivized the to give you a. That's it. Yeah, they're they're looking at how I'm gonna make this money, how I'm gonna get this partnership, how I'm gonna have this branding deal, how I'm gonna do. Mm-hmm. They're looking at all of that, which is cool. Because yeah. now we understand music is ultimately, from business, music is just a vehicle to get to all of those other things. We know yeah. that. Yeah, as an artist, yeah, the music is just now a part of your career. It's like, yeah. Versus before you were a musician. Yeah, so you know, from a like, business standpoint, I get it, but I, I do feel like you should never really compromise mm-hmm. to do that. You can still make great music. There's a lot of people who make great music and have integrity with what they do and still be able to partner that with brands and do a bunch of other stuff and still get to a bag. So I don't think you got to be like... I just think, you know, again, the playing field is so leveled with the entry, the level, the entry of getting into the music industry is so, the bar is so low. You could, it's just allowing everybody to get in. There's no gatekeepers, which yeah. we have this debate all the time. Me and, and, and some people at the studio is like, they feel like we shouldn't have gatekeepers because yeah. if you had gatekeepers, a lot of things wouldn't have got through and you maybe you maybe wouldn't have a Drake or you maybe you wouldn't have a Kanye or this person or that person. But mm-hmm. I feel like you still need, no matter what, you still need tastemakers. I don't even want to call mm-hmm. them gatekeepers. You need people that let you know this is not hot. This is yeah. not good. It may work and it may sell, but you know, in our time, we had people who curated taste. So you knew what how to dress. You mm-hmm. knew what was fly. You knew what music sounded good. You knew what, you know what I mean? It's like mm-hmm. without that, everything is good. You know what I'm saying? We don't know. We don't have nothing to gauge what's good and what's bad on because mm-hmm. if a nigga start winning musically, mm-hmm. 
you know, as far as his sales. And then he's good. That's what they attribute it being good. How much did he sell? So yeah. So X many. He streamed this many records. Like I tell people all the time, I sometimes I watch videos or listen <laughs> to songs to laugh at people. You know what I'm saying? But they still got my stream. Yeah. So that doesn't mean that I thought it was good. I might literally, we used to sit in the studio, play niggas and watch videos and be cracking up. But yeah. we still giving them attention, streams, and engagement. We might even be commenting, saying funny shit. That Man. all helps them appear to seem like they're more important. So I, we Man. can't gauge it on the interaction of people watching a video or clicking on something to say whether something's good or not. But in our time, bro, and I always, I hate because I feel like an old nigga when I say it, our time mm -hmm. back in the day. Mm -hmm. But there was just a precedent that was set yeah. that made things a lot smoother. But the systems that were in place, yeah. Now, do I... What I do love about today is the the opportunities and the options from in terms of deals and what kind of money and what kind of things you and money you can make now mm -hmm. and the type of deals you can have now. But I feel like you don't have to compromise the integrity to do it. And that's where the, mm -hmm. the lines get blurred for me. I feel like people feel like you don't have to make good music. You could just do some any old thing and because they giving out bags for you just I'm gonna just go this route. Yeah. And I, I think that's for me, that's my, you know, that's my plight with it. I don't really like that. So that's why I do believe we need, I don't even want to call them gatekeepers, but we need mm -hmm. tastemakers because yeah. some niggas have no taste. That's just, honestly, that's just a fact. Honestly, though, have you noticed, like, or do you do you feel like, um, even on the creative side, like, do you feel like there's no more record men in the business? Like, there's no more A&Rs or executives that will go to the mat for a song like that'll be like no this is a hit and we'll fight for a record you think do you feel like it, far and few and and again they're compromised so mm -hmm. even if they even there's people from that cloth and from that era and they're running around with artists making horrible music every day because the bag is there so there's the integrity to get compromised it's like you got somebody you know i've, I've seen a and r's I, i'm not going to say their name but i see a and r's or people who are from the industry from that cloth that no one understand about a hit record but they got in a position where they could have changed things, but they might have signed some writers or mm -hmm. they might have signed some producers to them. And then when it was time to deliver an album for a certain artist and really help where they could really do some great things, the money blinded them because it's like, no, I'm going to put my writers on it. Your writers may not be the most qualified. Your producers yep. may not be the most qualified. But now we play in that game where it's about, okay, I'm going to milk the budget or I'm going to get this amount of money. So then, again, that's why I mean the integrity and the lines get blurred. Mm -hmm. It's like you're supposed to deliver the best possible music you can. When I hear albums, I know. I could literally tell when it's like, oh, that was, a, that was some alley-oop or that mm -hmm. was a love you know what I'm saying, hook up, or that was a relationship. It wasn't about a good record. Even some singles. When you hear certain records, I could go, yeah. How did, how how with the people involved did they allow this to, to, mm -hmm. to even touch the airways? Mm -hmm. But it's so much politics, so much BS, and so much, you know what I'm saying, lines get blurred when you're talking about dollars and cents. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? And, and you know when you're working, a lot of people also don't have the power. Even though they're in a position, they yep. got to follow a system that exists already. They can't even mm -hmm. come in and be like, I want to do this. I want to bring in this person, or I think this is the best songwriter. Some mm -hmm. people will fight for it, but it's far and few. I don't. I don't think there's many. Yeah, I do think there's some, but there, there's not enough to, in my opinion, and position that's willing to take that chance. Even signing artists, bro. I understand it's a business, and I do know they want to make a return on their investment. But mm -hmm. I, I don't believe that you should be signing artists solely on metrics. Yeah. I agree. Not not your whole entire roster. And most labels rosters, they're signing artists based on metrics and, and, and mm -hmm. analytics and things of that and nature. That's not, versus, that's not sustainable or, you know, no. like a true measure of a star. No. And and for me, you know, I when I when I first started to realize how things really worked internally, um, being around, you know, in labels and turn and seeing the internal inner workings of how they, you know, how, what their expectations are, even mm -hmm. how they process things or why they sign certain artists or why they allocate certain amount of funds for certain projects. Mm -hmm. Once I learned that, then it all made sense. And then I understood the business of it. They mm -hmm. like, they're not necessarily thinking if they sign a hundred artists, they don't expect a hundred artists to blow. I didn't know that back right. then. I thought that, oh, if you sign this person, you, you, you want all of them to blow in mm -hmm. a, in a perfect world. Yeah, they do. But they know maybe 10 of these artists is going to keep, everything going mm -hmm. and they understand that maybe these other you know 90 
you know, they what what the combination of their sales or what they do will give us this other money. But these mm-hmm. ten are gonna keep the lights on and make us the profit. And so that's why they consistently invest in those big, you know, the artists that bring them the big numbers. But I yeah. think, you know, when you don't really understand that and you're looking at it from just a talent perspective or they should just sign this because of that. Like I get the business of it, but I do feel like there should be just more of a balance. Because in the time period prior to now, that is, it's it's true. You mm-hmm. always had it's always been a business. They've always wanted to make money. Mm-hmm. But they were also confident enough to know that if I sign this artist and develop him, he's gonna make me money. Yeah. You know what I mean? If I help develop him, if he has the potential, if it's there, we could do that. But you know, we in a instant gratification world, so okay. you know, people want instant. They don't want no I'm going to sign him. I remember Onyx was signed for like a year and a half before mm-hmm. they really, you know, they groomed them, got them ready, got them performing. I mean, even when I was an artist back in the day, they would make us go to, um, we would have uh, PR, like we mm-hmm. signed to, assigned to PR, and they would tell us, you know, train us how to do media, media mm-hmm. training. When I watched some interviews with people, bro, I watched the interview, I forgot the artist's name. I watched the interview the other day. This guy, he was just basically rambling, and he said, they asked him, about how he got started. He was talking about how he was a athlete or something in college, and he turned down a, a scholarship where he had a scholarship. But he was just <laughs> lying, and yeah. the dude was catching him. It's a, it's a meme. It's all online now. I forgot his mm-hmm. name. It's Dark Skin Dude, rapper. Mm-hmm. Um, and But I'm like, if he was media trained, there's no way they would allow some of the stuff that they say, even the guys that get on there and tell them they sell. Yeah. You wouldn't even be saying all of this stuff if they were trained properly to do an interview. It's just like they don't care now because they're looking at it as, again, I'm going to make the most money out of this guy. Then he's disposable. We're going to get rid of him. Mm -hmm. They don't care. We're going to get the most out of this person. They're not looking to necessarily build stars because they don't care. They figured out a system, especially since streaming. Mm -hmm. They figured out a system. This is how we're going to generate our money and make our money. And we, if, if some good things come through, they're great. But for the most part, we just figured out a way to kind of, as I always say, print money. Mm-hmm. You know, and once they print in money, you know, you got to kind of get in where you fit in. You know what I'm saying? At that point. Nice. You know what I mean? But um, so how did it, another question. I know um, we've talked about this in the past as far as um the the – Ghost producing or, you mm-hmm. know, working under producers and, you know, how, what's your what's your take on it? And I know I know you played a part and we've all done that at some point in our career. I don't know necessarily if your situation was ghost producing or if it was, you know what I mean? But you can kind of expound on that a little bit more. But what's your take on, like, as far as, like, producers working under bigger name producers? I mean, I did it. Um, I've done my ghost work. I say if it... Um if it furthers your career, furthers your knowledge base, I'm all for it. You know, you you just got to be willing to do it. And I don't know that every producer is willing to do it because everybody now wants to shine. Mm-hmm. And cats aren't looking at it like, shoot, I can go over here and ghost real fast and maybe not get credit, maybe not get credits, but have publishing on a hit record or go over here and ghost produce and make a quick 15, 20 bands. And nobody ever know that I did that record, but... I got 15, 20 bands in my pocket. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? Like I make a hundred beats a day, you know, or a hundred beats in a month. That one beat that got away from me. Hey, I still made something off of it. Even though somebody might go and make a million dollars off of it. Hey, I still made something off of it. I know that I did it. And I look at it like, I created a new customer because they get a hit record off of it. They coming back. They coming back. Yeah. 10 more of those. Yeah. And then at that point, you may be able to negotiate something different. So yeah, that's, I kind of have a similar take on that. I, I'm not a I'm not an advocate because I don't again, like I said, I'm I'm all for people getting their credit. Mm-hmm. I think ghost producing and paying your dues and working under a a, a bigger name producer mm-hmm. is kind of different. And I, I don't I, I'm not an advocate for necessarily being a ghost producer because mm-hmm. I think that's like again robbing somebody of their credit. And I don't understand why for what reason. Would, if I'm in a position to kind of help people or, or, or opportunity where I can benefit from you doing this beat, mm-hmm. but at the same token reach back and help you, I don't know why I need to keep you in the shadows. I always thought mm-hmm. that that was just a, a real like a narcissistic you know, mm-hmm. place for people that did that. And yeah. when I look, you know, you see all of these stories. There's a lot of people. 
I've heard both. I've heard from even from some people. My experience with them, I've never ghost produced for them. Mm -hmm. I worked with Teddy Riley, I was credited. I worked with Strat Masters, I was credited. Mm -hmm. I worked with um you know, 45 King, I was credited. I never was in a situation where um I wasn't credited for my contributions. But I, I've heard people who work with some of those same people and they mm -hmm. weren't. I worked with KG, same thing, and he and was credited. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of times though, um that whole thing about it. It's just like a weird, like taboo kind of thing when you, people mm -hmm. talk about ghost producing or working under somebody, you know, and they mm -hmm. hear these stories, you know, for you. And then you hear the turmoil sometimes because like you just said, most people want to shine. So it's hard if I'm doing this, mm -hmm. like, you know, when you think, let's just think about Scott Storch with Dr. Dre. Mm -hmm. The most memorable pianos, I would probably say piano line in fucking hip hop mm -hmm. is still Dre. Yep. Like you, you can't, it's undeniable. Yeah. And he played it. Yeah. Right? Dre didn't, I mean, by Dre's admission and his admission, he didn't tell him what to play. He just was playing, and Dre heard it. Yeah, keep that. Mm -hmm. Right? So it's hard when you see someone say, Dr. Dre did it. For him, I know it ate him up for years. Mm -hmm. He's in a better space now, but I remember him kind of lashing out at Dre, mm -hmm. lashing out at Timbaland for Cry Me a River. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of records at that time because I think he wanted to be acknowledged as a producer and a contributor and not just a songwriter or keyboard player. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Or as they start coining him piano man. Yeah, they called him funny. piano man. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? But we clearly know he had the ability to produce because he did in that same time period. He started producing for tons of people. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it is hard, a hard pill to swallow. Even when you credit it, if it's like, I want to be in the forefront. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So like you said, I think it is a a hard place to be if you're somebody that necessarily needs that. I was never in music for attention. Yeah. And and so for me, I could do some of those things. Some I would want credit and I do want to get paid, but I could I could do without the fanfare and the bells and whistles mm -hmm. about a lot of stuff. So Yeah, I I fight with that now. Um yeah. with some of the musicians that I might bring in on record. You know what I'm saying? Because mm -hmm. I'm more like I don't I don't want to say I don't like somebody trying to outshine me. Mm. <laughs> because I feel like I'm opening the door for them to yeah. fit their career. What I do try to do for people, which may not always have been done for me, is I do try to give people co-pro credit or I at least try to further their journey by making sure they get an allmusic.com credit if they work with me because I know how important that is to yeah. their overall career. Yeah. And that's, I think, again, based on some of your experiences, and, and we all, we have... I don't want to say like we had some trauma, but we mm -hmm. all went through some stuff mm -hmm. earlier on that I think we look at things a lot different when we are approached with working with, you know, newer producers or newer artists or up and coming guys. I think mm -hmm. um, we look at it a little a lot differently. And I think mm -hmm. the scope of stuff is just a little more open. Like when I, I, was, I think I was watching an interview yesterday, I don't know who it was, but they were just talking about contracts that people signed at a time and mm -hmm. and they literally was just saying you know people always complain about oh puff was jerking people or this person was jerking people or mm -hmm. andrea rail was jerking people you do know they had a contract with a mm -hmm. major label that set a standard for what their contract could be okay they, could, they couldn't give you more than mm -hmm. what the contract that they had with that parent company to do you know what i mean mm -hmm. so not saying they weren't giving out bad deals, but they were giving out deals based on what they could give out based on what was given to them. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it just trickled down. And over time, the barriers and things have started. That's why I said I love about today, the mm -hmm. deals and the opportunities and what you can have and what you can get. It's just way better. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? It's way better than, than it was then. And if you're smart enough and you're knowledgeable enough, mm -hmm. you can do a, a whole lot more than a, a lot of, uh, people have been able to do in the past. So I, I do love that. I do love all mm -hmm. of the avenues. So, I, so speaking on that, when we talk about avenues and with producers, what's your take on producers, like the beat, the YouTube producer or the online beat star, beat store producer? Uh, you know what? I, I'm not even going to lie to you. I am I know I'm late to the party. I'm starting to get into it. Um, okay. I'm okay. Lounge, so I, I mess with licensed lounge because I feel like they got, a, they got the best concept. Okay. Because with License Lounge, um, you know, how people are online and they try to do tight beats. And it's like, oh, I'm doing a Lex Luger tight beat. Mm -hmm. And so I'm on License Lounge and Lex Luger is on License Lounge. So you can come and for the same price, get 
a Lex Luger beat. Mm. You know, yeah, that's dope. You don't got to deal with a new producer when you can get one directly from Lex Luger. You know, and some of the other hit producers that are on there. So I'm late to the party, but I'm I'm embracing it because I know that this is a revenue stream that these kids have, and I didn't understand it at first. Same here. But now I see it. I'm like, okay, if you get popular and you get a you got all your beats up there and your beats are getting a hundred thousand views, 200,000 views and you got subscribers. I mean, that's money, you know? Yeah. It, yeah. I mean, it don't even matter if, if it ever come out because you're making money off of the instrumental sitting there online and people are in their studios, which I don't like, like <laughs> ripping it off of YouTube and making their songs. Now you got a hundred thousand people with your beat on a mixtape, but you made money off of it. Somebody's going to contact you and want to buy yeah. the beat. You, you hope. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I also, I introduced a whole lot of other, because another thing I love about the technology today is I always tell people, don't be afraid to put your music online, put it on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And as long as you do the administrative uh, work behind the scenes, if someone rips a beat that I put on YouTube, if I content I did and I registered properly and do the things I need to do, mm -hmm. you have beat the tech where people can, you can actually detect who uses your music all over the internet Mm -hmm. And you can reach out to them that way, or you have the content ID where as soon as they put it, because anybody that does music today is going to put it on YouTube, mm -hmm. and you can monetize it. So you could either have the option to take it down, which is crazy. I would never do that. Mm -hmm. But I let you keep running, going crazy with it, and just monetize it, and we make money together, and then reach out and maybe form that relationship like you was talking about mm -hmm. um, from somebody using your music. So I just think it's so many ways to make money from it now that I, I, I wouldn't turn it down. Back you know, like I said, when it was first coming around, I'm like, because I'm making, even on locally, somebody buying a beat, I'm getting 2500 mm -hmm. 3000 1500 So when somebody's talking about they're going to lease you a beat for 300 all the way down to $50, $25, $10, I thought it was crazy, but I mm -hmm. didn't look at it from a volume perspective. And when yeah. somebody broke it down like a Walmart kind of a, a, a supermarket type concept mm -hmm. to it where it's like, okay, you know, Walmart might have something in there for a dollar ninety nine, but they might have ten thousand of them. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Versus you going to a store and you buying a high ticket priced item, it may take you longer to get that sold. And I know because I was experiencing it. Nobody's coming by a twenty five hundred dollar beat no more. Mm -hmm. Nobody was coming to buy a five thousand dollar beat no more mm -hmm. from you. even within the industry. They weren't really paying upfront advances, so you just sitting around with a computer and a hard drive full of beats. So you're not making any money. So it kind of made sense to be like, oh, well, you can create revenue, especially when you're not giving the full rights to it. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody buys your same beat and leases it over and over. hundred people lease your beat for $10. That's $1,000. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So instead of it sitting on your computer hoping somebody buys one beat for $1,000, you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. it definitely made sense. So when I saw that, I was like, you know, they on to something. Yeah. It, it took a little time to get it worked out because at first it was still a little tricky. Yeah, but um, I think it's in a good space, like you saying, with platforms like what you were talking about, Beat Stars, um, some other. I see United Masters, even TuneCore, a couple other places are mm -hmm. starting to have beat stores and stuff. Yeah, I see Sound I Better that's... as that. I'm trying to get on mm -hmm. Sound Better now. Yeah, yep, Sound Better as well. So I think that's dope. Um, and it gives it gives uh it builds an economy. I think our economy was getting advances off the top from the labels or. Yep. Like you said, local artists, but now with that kind of dwindling now, you know, I was talking to somebody the other day who's a fairly, I mean, he's a big known producer, a big name producer with a lot of hits, and he's telling me, yeah, I got to fight to get 25000 in yep. advance. I yep. said, what? Is, yeah, it's bad out here, brother. You know what I'm you saying? Know, you just want to hope you get a hit, because if you don't, the, it ain't no more running up, getting these advances, and he's like, yeah, oh. it's not like that no more, and this is a person who's has hits on the radio currently. It ain't even like a... Some dude that's just new, up and coming. He's had hits in the past. He had hits on the radio currently. And when he told me that, I was like, "Yeah, it's, that's dangerous." You know, in a movie, <laughs> the label just 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 doing a uh, um a, a quick little production deal with you and buying ten beats up front. Mm -hmm. Where you like, okay, I got ten beats. So, you know, I got a, a song, a deal over at Def Jam. I, I I cleared out a quick half a million because they paying me mm -hmm. fifty beat over here. I got one in Capital. Got one. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, you see that Britain, ooh. No. Yeah, that was my first introduction on the production side was a song deal. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? We had a, a 40 song deal. You know what I mean? That was amazing. For somebody mm -hmm. entry level coming in, it's like you these are guaranteed placements because you're gonna they're gonna place, mm -hmm. they're gonna be on albums, they're gonna be, and that, that was a great 
working experience and opportunity. It's like now mm-hmm. they don't, you know, everything is so internal and in-house within mm-hmm. the people that they sign. So it's kind of no way to really even for a label to do that. They yeah. can't really force people to work with, you know, artists yeah. anymore. I mean, with producers anymore. That's definitely the difference now, you know, like used to be like when we would get the who's looking list, you knew who to send music <laughs> to and they were in with the artists. Now, you yeah, know, artists no. get signed. They got pretty much a whole internal team. Yeah, doing everything. You know what I'm saying? I mean, yeah, people from the label are asking you for music for that artist, but if you ain't really got a way into that that person's camp or even directly to the artist, you ain't... Like, okay. The record I got with Ross, I only got that because, I mean, the relationship with, an, uh, um, a, like, one of his engineers um, and dude basically, you know, brokered the situation with getting him on Jay Holiday's album and he took some beats and, you know, I guess Ross has everybody and their mom's beats on his computer and he just picked the beat out. Like, he just, <laughs> he just sits down and he just go through beats and just yeah. what he wants to. Oh, that's dope. Yeah, so that, that's, you know, I mean, it's a shot in the dark, but you, you, you know, when you get it, it's, it's big for your resume, you know? Oh, of course, of course. So, here's my geeky question, my nerd mm-hmm. question. Mm-hmm. Software versus hardware. Where you stand? Mm. Um, it's kind of funny because I just seen a whole debate people were having on Twitter about this kid was going in like trying to swear out that Fruity Loops hits harder than all the other dogs. I know. I'm saying like, dude, it's the same computer, same engine. I'm like, <laughs> if you really was into production, you know, the only time that we've all heard the music change was when they went from Pro Tools Seven to Pro Tools Eight. <laughs> on the time you heard it and then when they and then when the Apollo the Universal Audio stuff came out mm-hmm. difference in your sound other than that I, there's it, it, it's the same I mean but I mean well let me say this I there's still a difference when I bring sounds off of an analog keyboard like I got you know I got the Trinity over here in the corner you know you know I got my babies over here so it's still sort of a difference but I mean I feel like if you know what you're doing you can get that sound. Yeah. And I think now because of how things are, you know, you, you're, you're, you're going to always skew towards the software because you're working faster. That's what I was about to say. I think the, the upside of software is the, the workflow, like how, how much faster, how quicker you can get to something and do something and mm-hmm. how more, how compact and how, you know, you can travel around and move around mm-hmm. a lot easier and better. You know, yeah. I always, I always compare it to uh, when people be like, uh, it's, it's using it from a DJ standpoint. Would you rather carry 30 crates of records or a hard drive <laughs> in your book bag? Mm-hmm. Which, one, which one would you rather? Right. You know what I mean? If you if you so anti-technology, you I mean, you should be riding a horse. Nigga. Mm-hmm. Like, you shouldn't even get yeah. in a car, right? You should, you shouldn't even be get in on a, a horse, right? Get on a horse. You should have one, a coat. You should have one. A robe, like we've been mm-hmm. there. So as it advanced, you have to embrace the technology and mm-hmm. use it for the betterment of what you know how to do. So I feel like if you are talented, like how you are, you're a technical guy. Mm-hmm. Um, you understand computer, you understand, you know, sonics, everything, and you're a creative person as well. Mm-hmm. So when you combine the two, it's only going to advance what you're able to do. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Now, what it does do that I feel like the downside is, again, it brings the entry level meaning anybody can participate now. Mm-hmm. Not necessarily the skilled producer, musician, singer, songwriter, mm-hmm. whoever. It just levels the playing field where everybody can jump in, and now we got a cesspool of madness. So <laughs> it makes yeah. it harder to weed through. You know what so, I mean? I'm like... Do you, do you think, like, we're about to get into a dangerous place in that with that, that, with that mindset? Like, because, like, I'm trying to figure out how to say it the right way. Because everybody feels like they can make music and they don't really understand the ins and outs that you and I know as far as like how to make something that people want to consume, like not even just stream, but something that people want to buy. Because there's a there's still a dividing line between those of us that know how to make stuff that people want to buy versus stuff that somebody wants to stream. Do you think we're about to get into a dangerous place with AI and AI creating melodies and stuff for people? I think we've we've been in a dangerous space and this is only just going to multiply it and and speed up the process. Mm-hmm. We've been in a dangerous space like we when we talk about the quality of music. That's mm-hmm. what that's been. Mm-hmm. We've been using AI when you when you get um these 
plugins or these virtual instruments or these programs that do everything for you. That was kind of a form of AI then. You didn't have to know how to play any, at least when I started, I wasn't a musician, musician, so to mm -hmm. speak, but you did have to know how to play it to some okay. degree to play your ideas out. Or you did have to know, mm -hmm. even when we were sampling, um, if I sampled a bass line from uh, a Mar Jamal record mm -hmm. and then I put the horns from a Tom Scott record, I had to know to put those in key. Yep. Even if I didn't understand what I was doing, I still mm -hmm. knew that that has to match with that. I can't just add this horn and this could be in this key and that be in that key and it's just going to blend. No, it has to make sense sonically and mm -hmm. musically. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So I think even with that time period, it still forced you to learn some form of musicality. And that's how I started to really learn keys and scales and octaves and things of that nature. I started out sampling. I wasn't playing no instruments. Mm -hmm. you know. But yeah. from that, I learned. And I learned what meshed well. I learned you know, how drums should sound. So when I'm programming them, I'm not doing things that are totally against how a drum a drummer would play it. So it sounds more natural. I'm yeah. not playing out of the confines of what that instrument would do. You know we what I mean? Learn how to compose. Exactly. Not, so yeah, we learn what, Yeah, not just <laughs> jam a bunch of shit together. So now you're dealing with <clears throat> out of tune eight oh eights, out of you know out of tune drums, even drums People don't understand everything is a tune. Everything has mm -hmm. to be in some form of a key or some chemistry, mm -hmm. right? So if I take this loud snare from this and this weird uh, rim shot from here and this tight high, like it still has to make sense. Mm -hmm. And I think that when you make it a, it's a, it's a, it's a scary thing when you hear people say there's no rules in music. No, there is. Yeah, there are. It is rules in music. Yes, mm -hmm. you can be as creative as you want within the confines of things. Mm -hmm. Like, and I think that when you say there's no rules, it's just like when I watch these gurus online, oh, you can get into real estate with no money. That's a lie. That's a, a complete lie. Mm -hmm. you, yeah, you can get in it with no money, but you'll also lose everything you got if you don't have any money. Okay. That's just not a reality. You okay. know, it's partially the truth. Part of that is the truth. You might not necessarily need a substantial amount of money to get in, but once you're in to sustain it, you need money. Yep. That's just the, the be a homeowner, you have to have money for when things happen. Yep. If you are a, a landlord, you gotta have money in case you gotta repair somebody's window or toilet. Like it's it's just not a realistic thing. And when it comes to music, when they try to say there's no rules, there are rules. Mm -hmm. There's rules to making a hit. There's rules to what resonates with people. We know why. We know why there's a commonality in all of these records. When you go back and listen to them, they all have a commonality. They all have some comparisons and comparable elements that make them what they are. We mm -hmm. know that, you know, it has to have a hook. Not necessarily the chorus may not be the hook, but it has to have a hook in it. Something in it that catches somebody that hooks them in. That's yeah. a fact. You yeah. know, that's why when they say, oh, I just like the beat or the beat and the hook. I mean, that's kind of almost mm -hmm. the, the song, the beat there's, and the hook. Say, there's a reason why. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's a science. Everything in life, there's a science to it. Nothing is just because it is. Yep. There's no such, in my opinion, I don't believe in luck. You know what yep. I'm saying? It, no. Nothing is just because. It's a science to it, whether we know what the science is or not. There is a science to everything, and there's a reason to everything. We might not know the answer to everything, but there's a reason. Yeah. There's no just, this happened. Agree. No, it doesn't happen that way. So, so yeah. it's a weird thing, man. You know. So, hmm. let me speed speed things back up a little bit, right? Um, tell them what, what you got going on right now. We know what you've done. We know <laughs> who you work with. Let them know what you got going on right now, my brother. Still got still got a nice you know amount of things in the pipeline. I'm waiting. I'm still ready for this record to drop. I got with um Jamie Foxx as artist Jay Young. Um, got mm. a, and Snoop Dogg and Too Short on it. That just been waiting for that to see the light of day. Okay. Um, I got a, a stupid, stupid single with Case. Um, it's a new super group. It's Case featuring RL and Raheem Devon. Like, Ooh, I'm banging. Okay. Okay. And, and a slow song like people would expect. It's not even gonna be a slow song. It's gonna be something for the club where you'd be like, okay. Um, All right. you know, Demetri McKinney's second album. I got my group um, lyrics. I got their album. Um, we just brought on the group Black. So just getting started working on okay. their their project. Um, just a lot of TV and film stuff I've been working on. Um, and then, you know, just some other younger artists, you know, independent artists. I've been, I've been back doing younger stuff. So, okay. Gotcha. Jumping into that part of it, you know? Got to. And, and, and let everybody out there know where they can get in touch with you. If you're you know, looking for music, you're me. looking for writers, where you at? Where you at? I always find me here in the purple room. So, you know, my Instagram at the real Travis Cherry, the easiest place. Hit me up. 
I'm here. You know, the purple room is here. <laughs> Y'all hear that purple the room? Hot pins. Hot pins. You you hear this? The purple room. Hey, produce, my boy. I might I might just send some melodies over to you. Need you to do some trap drums or something. You know? Hey man, we we gotta do what we gotta do. That we uh, before I'm we leave. What's your take on producer collaboration? What's your what's your how many producers can you collaborate? How many people you want on? I mean, one if song? I didn't need somebody to do some drums real fast, that's one thing. But I don't know that I need nine people in the room. <laughs> doing, you know what I'm saying? Because I because I get frustrated. I'm like, man, you know, I can do this all myself. <laughs> it, I mean, technically, right? Yeah. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Yeah. All right, man. So we are gonna wrap this up. Another episode of Check the Credits Podcast. My boy Travis Cherry, man. Let y'all know where you can tap in with him at already. So at this point, the only thing we gonna ask y'all to do and continue to do is continue to check the credits, y'all. Yeah, y'all support. That's what it is. Peace. Woo! Woo!